Hi, everybody. Adam Savage in my cave with a really fun one today. There, I'm always excited about them. What am I saying? Uh, I possess several suits of armor in my collection, and I purchased this one a few years ago. Uh, and it is like my King Arthur armor, built by Master Armor Terry English. And this was built for the movie Excalibur. In fact, Mordred. Uh, the villain, this is his key lieutenant's armor. Um, and I'm delighted to own this piece. It's a great piece. The, it's just, it's a terrific suit of armor. It is, however, missing a couple of pieces. I, I will also tell you that when I told Terry English that I owned this armor, he gave me this helmet, which is the same casting uses the base of the lieutenant's helmet, so he helped me complete this, but it's still missing a few pieces. It is missing a circular shoulder protector here, the right elbow cop, um, and it's missing the tassets, uh, the, two, um, the two flaps here that protect your upper thighs while riding, um, and uh, what uh, chain mail. It has no chain mail, but oh, oh, gauntlets, gauntlets. No gauntlets on this board. So I'm going to make the shoulder thing, the elbow cop, the tassets, and the uh, gauntlets. It's armor here. I've got a nice chunk of some 30 thousandths, uh, 3003, very um, formable, workable aluminum. I have cut out a circle. I've called it the shoulder circle. Um, and I realized if I'm going to make this circle, I'm going to need a dishing block. I'm gonna need a piece of wood that I can hammer into. Now, normally I would, what I really want is a dishing stump. I just haven't gotten around to buying a stump and then dishing it. But what I do have is a chunk of cedar. This is one of the chunks I purchased for the Samaritan grips. Uh, and I've chucked it onto my lathe and I'm about to uh, carve a dish in it. And then we'll get to the holy hammering. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one I've been putting off for a couple of years now, so I'm really excited to take it off my books and complete that suit of armor. And then I'll have two complete Terry English suits of armor. Dude! All right, here we go. I got a pretty good bowl here. I'll be honest, I thought I was rolling, but it turned out I wasn't. So what I did was I lathed a bowl out of cedar here. This... There's a nice dish of cedar, and I think this is a fine hammer dish, dishing bowl. It, yeah, armor. Let's get to hammering. All right. Let's see what we can do. Wow, that's really pretty. All right, now I want to bend over the sides a little bit. So, let's see. Ha-ha! <laughs> All right. I've got a little staking block here. Hmm. Yeah. I kind of want it to be... I'm a uh, I'm not displeased with that, I will admit. All right, um, so I have, uh, I've hammered this into a rough shape. This border will get taken way down and I'm pretty happy with this. This is a great piece to kind of practice on, uh, but I've work hardened it. So I'm going to anneal it. And the trick that Terry English taught me for annealing this aluminum was to draw on it with Sharpie 
and stop heating it when the Sharpie goes away. There we go. I let that cool and it's now softened up again. Hey! <laughs> I didn't think that would work so well. That's great. Dude, dude, I'm mighty pleased with that. Oh, if you've been like watching me do something, I'm so sorry. I'm pretty pleased by this. Um, been a while since I've hammered some aluminum and I think I've come up with something that looks pretty darn good. Let's um, let's go look at it. Here is the armor and here is where this piece went. It hung right here. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm already happy with it. Um, next up, I'm gonna make the tassets, which uh, have a different kind of edge than just a bent over edge. They've got a rolled edge like this piece here. So I'm gonna have to do that. I have a pattern for the tassets. Uh, reminder, tassets are, um, tassets are the chaps of armor. How about that? Tassets go right here. There are these like, so when you're riding, they sit up on your thighs and hopefully protect you, I guess. Um, so what I noticed is that the tassets in the film for Mordred's henchmen, are very crude, which actually makes sense narratively. Like these, these are the bad guys. They're pounded together armor really fast, like the orcs in Two Towers, right? It's just, whatever works, get it on their heads, get them out the door. This is the same thing. So this is my template for Mordred's Lieutenant's Tacit. Uh, there are some bolts that are hammered into it. Some big, what look like rivet heads, but they're hammered right into the aluminum. I'm going to trace this out and cut out a pair of these and then uh, hammer them into um, the curve that I like. And then, yeah, I'm gonna roll the edge. I haven't rolled an edge in three years, so let's see how it goes. The order of operations here is that I'm gonna do the tacits, then I'm gonna do the elbow cop, and then I'm gonna do the gauntlets. The gauntlets, uh, technically I should do them first because they're the hardest part of this, but I also would like to be at the top of my game when I tackle them, so all the other pieces, all the other pieces are for me to practice. Practice! We're talking about practice, Jamie. Not Jamie Heineman. Jamie Tot. Uh, 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 Jamie Tot. Uh, uh. Okay, that's enough. Now this thirty thousandths aluminum, I could cut it out with pin snips, but I have one that I like much better, and that is the air nibbler. I think you should see the air nibbler up close. those were awful in different ways. I will point out that the nibbler I just used leaves, drops all of these tiny little half moons of sharp aluminum. You don't want to get one of those in your sock. 
Uh, the nibbler here is great, but it mostly is only great for straight lines. The shears here are great. If they're on the wrong side of the cut, they can do this, but I'm gonna clean these up on the belt sander. That's what's nice. Also, whenever you're cutting sheet metal, just remember, these, these edges can just slice and dice you to ribbons. Just be careful. That was me turning on the camera with my nose because my hands have gloves on them. Why, why would I scratch my nose on camera while you watch? Well, just because my nose itches right there. All right, here's my tassets. Yeah. Let's get a sandbag. Spectacular sound design. All right, I want to anneal these first. So I'm just gonna, so you can see this happen. I'm just going to hit them with Sharpie across their whole surface. I'll let those cool, and they're ready for the hammering. I'm really pretty happy with that. Let's move on to the next one. All right. I think it's almost time to roll the edges of these things. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna try these for pinching this edge up a bit. We're doing the sort of broad strokes of this because it just saves me a lot of time. Excellent. It's done very well. I'm a, ah, whoa, sorry. This, yeah, I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty happy with how this came out. Well, how it's coming out. And I'm still, uh...
that's not recommended. Well, at least it still runs. Now I can't find any pictures of the tacits of this particular bad guy, but I do have some pictures of tacits of some of the other guys. I mean, they're not that regular, but there's like a one there. And then there's like a big one there. Oh, here comes the hard part. I know it looks like I know what I'm doing, but I assure you inside here, it does not feel like that. Nice! I'm getting better at it. Uh, now, time for the elbow cop. That is the right arm elbow protector. It is missing on this armor. In the movie, I can see it. So, so, so. <laughs> Finishing a sentence with so. It doesn't quite work. Uh, all right, let's see here. There's my template, there's my piece, and yeah, this gets a big dish on the outside and then a couple of flares. Actually, before I forget to do it, let's take a look at the real thing. Here is the piece I'm going to replicate out of this. Yeah, I know, a lot of work. Uh, so I'll first do the dish here of the elbow then I'll do these two flares, top and bottom. Then I will do this edge. Yeah. And then I'll do these uh, big fake uh, rivets. And then I'll do this dish. That should get me to the end of today fairly handily. And tomorrow I'll work on the gauntlets. Uh, that's, that's the current plan. I can tell you, remember I said at the beginning of this video that the Nibbler puts out these little tiny half moons of aluminum. There's one in my shoe right now, and it's driving me crazy. Driving me crazy. Mark it on the wrong side. It needs to go. Okay, inside. 
and I'll bet Terry gets the measurements on this in exactly this way. Sharp these height. They're not that accurate. That's roughly accurate. I think we could go just a little bit lower. All right. Inside here we go. Uh, this one that I really well, yeah, that's good. Enough. much harder than any part I've done so far today because this I have to actually match something that exists. That's the hard part. Okay, I'm gonna kneel it again because I think I can get a better cupping, a better dish out of here. This elbow cop is a just a tough one, but I'm getting it slowly. Now, yeah, I keep using the word respectable. I think this is respectable. Now I have to do a bent edge all the way around it. I'm gonna do a little long wider than I need. And this one isn't a rolled edge so much as just a straight back edge. So I'm gonna go through this whole thing and uh, roll that back.
reader. <laughs> I got an elbow cup here. It's happening. Oh, right, right, right. I've got these two big bad boys. Right. So I gotta put uh, two big bolts right there and man, all I do today is misplace my marker. So this has been very edumacational. Um, here is my semi-crude elbow cop meant to replicate this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good effort. I'm not unhappy. I am not unhappy. <laughs> uh, the tacits down there and uh, shoulder, shoulder thing right here. Um, I need to experiment with some of that aluminum black because I think that's how this is treated. I think this is aluminum black. So I'm gonna put on some gloves and try that out. I gotta clean up a little bit first. Uh, day two of working on. Fun. Mike's caliber henchman armor. Um, I think it's worth talking about a couple of features of Terry English's beautiful and amazing armor designs. Um, first of all, I, I'll say this as many times as I bring up Terry's armor. For the movie Excalibur, he made 107 suits of armor, 107 suits of armor in less than three months. That's crazy. That's crazy. And I mean, if anything, he's faster now. Absolutely mind blowing. Um, but let's talk about the design work. Um, I bought this from Prop Store, uh, and uh, I think I'm gonna have to do a comparison at the end of this video, standing this next to the Arthurian armor and talk about the narrative aspects of the two armors. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'd like to point out one feature that Terry said he got from John Borman, which is this edge here, uh, this heavy, bent over edge. You can see it here on the elbow cop a little bit, but it's really prominent here on the chest placard. And Borman asked, according to Terry, what Terry told me was that Borman asked him to give an edge to make it look like the metal that the armor was made from was really thick. And when Terry uh, applied that to his armor, he's like, I really liked it. I've been doing it ever since. And it is a really distinctive and awesome look because it makes it look incredibly heavy. This whole thing is hammered out of 30 thousandths thick aluminum. That is uh, a 32nd of an inch, give or take. Um, uh, I also, uh, it's day two, I wanna say that uh, I do believe that this armor was chemically blackened because it's just not paint. And so I did a little bit of a test chemical blackening last night. And it's pretty, pretty freaking close. Uh, I'm gonna do this. It just slips down there for now. I'm gonna do this on camera in this video. I'm using a product called Gun Black. Uh, and so you'll get to see it when I do the gauntlets, but um, it's going really, really well. I'm very, it's all, a little bit sooty, but here's my elbow cop and here's the real one. And <clears throat> look, I'm, uh, I'm in distinct need of a lot more training, but I think I'm starting out from pretty good spot. Pretty good spot. It feels good. Um, I will always enjoy seeing this armor and knowing that I contribute contributed to its restoration. I hope Terry and his team would be, uh, Feel the same way. Gauntlets, as I was saying. Um, a couple of years ago for the Tested Premium Members gift, I drew up a poster, this poster in fact, uh, of a gauntlet and how it's put together. The gauntlet is, 
it's one of the more complicated. It's one of the more complicated parts. It's not a difficult part to make. There's just a lot of pieces to it. 24 separate pieces, uh, give or take, of aluminum. Yeah, and uh, that's just in one gauntlet. So it's, there's a lot of production around making a gauntlet, but I'm gonna walk you through the whole process. Also, here in this gauntlet poster, I included some templates which, if you blow them up, to match this ruler here, well, reader, you get a gauntlet that would fit me. <laughs> you, you, if you want to use this poster to make a gauntlet, uh, you need to fit it to your hand, so you want to do a test out of cardboard. Uh, but what I did was I blew this up 300% on my uh, computer, and I've got the I've got the template, so I'm going to use my own armor template as a gauntlet now. I am shifting up something a little bit. The, king, the gauntlet I followed was King Arthur's gauntlet, and it's a refined, lovely piece of work. Um, I'm gonna do something slightly different for the henchman armor here. Oh, that needs a little rebending. For the henchman armor here, I'm gonna make the, um, the, the, the wrist, brain drawing a blank. I'm gonna make this part of the gauntlet, <laughs> the wrist cone, uh, a uh, longer and a little bit bigger uh, because because he's a henchman. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna be modifying these patterns as I draw them on the aluminum. I'm not gonna be super precious about it. Um, it is. It's really, sorry, I was just like noticing every piece of armor uh, from Terry's shop has like Sharpie writing on the inside and many of them were used in multiple productions. So you get to see all these different names. Like this one went to Richardson and this one went to so-and-so. Um, this one clearly states on the inside, Mordred's Lieutenant has the actor's name. Um, and I can't remember if I told you at the beginning of this video, but when I was at Terry's shop and I told him that I owned this armor, he gave me this helmet, which is fiberglass, but cast by him in his shop. And this is absolutely the same base uh, helmet that was used for Mordred's Lieutenant. It's just great. Oh, also, also, uh, he could use some chain mail and I'm going to use some Weta Workshop chain mail that I have. This is Weta Workshop's brilliant injection molded chain mail. And yeah, I'm going to put a little, um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna attach this. It may go on the actor, me, the wearer, uh, but I'm gonna use some of the Weta chain mail for this guy, cause that just feels right and proper, I think, both John Borman and Weta Workshop and Terry English would all be pleased to have their work uh, coming together. Okay, I think that's everything. I have this, I'm a if I seem a little distracted, it's because this other part showed up this morning and I really wanna jump into that build, but I wanna finish this one first because I started it. Um, okay, time to take some templates, apply them to some aluminum and do some cutting out and then some shaping. We're gonna be done by lunch. We are never done by lunch. So it's time for me to cut out the fingers, the finger armor. These are called lames, L-A-M-E-S, lambs, lames, lames. Anyway, um, there are 28 finger lames and 10 finger tips. So uh, I have cut out a bunch of, I, I actually, so the first set of, 
I don't know why I keep thinking I have to give you all this back history. I almost ran out of the 30 thousandths aluminum. So I scabbed together all the finger lane material I could with the 30 thou aluminum I have on hand. I have ordered some more. This is such a beautiful thickness to work with for this type of armor. Um, so I'm cutting out 28 finger lames and 10 fingertips. And uh, I've got a little chopper here. I've got a little, uh, uh, what do you call it, shear uh, that I picked up a few years ago, a little six inch shear. And it makes fast work of these strips. I've got one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. Yeah, moving along. I like using, um, I really like using a shear whenever I can. To be honest, it is a nice low impact way. Are you serious that you actually don't provide a stop? I'm like kind of going a little crazy there. I mean, it's just a tool you really, you really have to work to hurt yourself on this tool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. I'm going to make more than 28. I think I have enough for a couple of gauntlets worth. And if I do, hell's bells, Margaret, I'm going to cut out a couple of gauntlets worth. Okay, those are the finger lames. Now the finger tips. Three. Hard to work when you can't see the work sometimes. Okay, By the way, uh, little, little shears and little metal breaks, really hard to find. When you do find them, get them. I paid like a hundred bucks for this on Craigslist. It's a phenomenal little tool. I put it on this aluminum base. Um, I only use it three or four times a year, but when I do, man, it allows me to do some really nice production work. Yeah, it's a great tool. Um, I'm not even sure I know who makes this. Oh yeah, here we go. This is a, oh yeah, this is a Diacro. Uh, and yeah. six inch, six inch shear, man. It's awesome. And my little stack of finger lames. All right, let's see here. All right, so this is a, this is a, pile, this is a pile of my fingertips. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Um, this is a pile of the fingertip lames. This is a pile of the finger knuckle lames. I'm about to shape them. And uh, I'm hoping to shape them in a single operation. We will see. We will see. Uh, I'm not gonna go for a super refined shape on these finger lamps. As I said, this is henchman armor. They don't, Mordred's on a budget. He's not, uh, he's not trying to make things luxurious for his soldiers. He simply wants them to kill. See that? They're not all perfect. I don't need them to be. These are rough and tumble. Henchman gauntlets. Ooh, nice light. All right, uh, gauntlet finger lames also have a curve to them. Uh, they're not just flat pieces. And I built a machine for putting that curve in them. And I think, I think it's up there. Hey. There it is, way up there. Excellent, okay. All 
All right, I can't find my machine for bending them. I can't find my machine for bending the lanes, but given that it's 30 thou, I'm just gonna use these guys. So it's just gonna be like, uh, this is a portable handheld metal brake. Wiss makes these, they're in several different form factors. I love them and I use them all the time. So I just do this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. And there, I've got a nice little bend. I, I Look, I know it's not smooth. Again, henchman armor. I worked on a NYU film in which one of the main characters was a gargoyle. And every time the director asked the director of photography, does this shot look real or not? The director of photography would go, the guy's got wings. It's not the best response, but it's funny. Not necessarily the response you want from your DP while he explains his excuse for not giving you a realistic shot. But, you know, such is life. Before I bend all of these, I have to poke holes in them. The fingertips get two holes, and all the rest get one hole right at the base. And I have a new, I have a new tool for making holes. This one. Uh, this tool actually saved my butt on Savage Builds making my Iron Man armor out of uh, 3D printed titanium because we couldn't cut, shape, or drill. <laughs> the 3D printed titanium. We didn't need to cut or shape it, but we definitely need to make a lot of holes in it because we had to rivet it together and drills wouldn't go through. So we bought this industrial punch and Tom Sachs had always told me, dude, get the an industrial punch on a workbench for like a standard eighth inch hole. It's just gonna make your life so much better. And he's totally right, it has. And here's, here's how easy it is to make an eighth inch hole. Just come up here, put this right there, bring this down. There we have a little eighth inch hole, damn straight, damn straight. All right, so uh, I'm gonna make a few of those. I think I can do probably two or three at once here. Think I can, think I can? Let's try five. Oh man, that would be amazing. Oh! Wow, it doesn't, it doesn't love that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have to work with those. This is just so much nicer than drilling. I mean, I know I could drill out all of these in a stack. I just, after all the cleanup, I find I'm just much happier doing them one at a time. But you see why gauntlets are labor intensive. Uh, I found a much easier way to bend the finger lames. And again, because this is henchman armor, I don't need a beautiful curve. Um, so I'm literally just using the flat part of my hammer and hammering them into the metal, just hammering them into the leather. And because the leather gives a little bit, it provides a little bit of a bend. And yeah, I think that's gonna be totally great, totally sufficient. And it's a very fast operation. Uh, the fingertips, I'm just gonna drill them with an eighth inch drill bit. That's what I'm doing here. That was two of them. Uh -huh. I have a few extras in here. I always make extras. Always make extras. If I have to make three of something, I start out planning to make five. If I end up with three, I'm good. Um, but frequently for a project, sometimes the unused parts of uh, another build are really good trading fodder to other people who like traffic in the same kind of prop work that I do. All right. Boy, ah, that was the 
hard busy work part of the equation. Now we move on to the uh, forming of the rest of the gauntlets. First rivet into my gauntlet. It's this top piece right at the wrist. Excellent. Excellent! Oh, now it's time to start assembling. And the first thing that happens is this gets uh, holes drilled. All right, so uh, left inside, right inside, left inside. So um, these, these wrist parts, they are meant to actually segment, protect you in a moving segmented way, like an armadillo's shell. So I'm aware that I kind of want these sides not to be perfectly parallel, but somewhat close to parallel. And then I'm gonna bend this to do the same thing. Nice. All right, so those are, oh, that's looking pretty good, actually. Great. Oh, I'm not gonna assemble this. I'm gonna do a temporary assemble, and I'm gonna do that with Clicos. And I discovered these on uh, the first Mythbusters trip to Alaska. They are rivet placement holders. So what you do is you squeeze it and it thins out this little set of, uh, this little thing out the front and you stick it through a hole you plan to rivet together and then release it and it'll hold that and allow you to actually test fit a whole bunch of rivet stuff. Yeah, super useful. And you can do stuff before you do stuff. Um, I'm also using my Ingersoll Rand uh, hole punch here. So much easier than the drill. Yeah, nice, much better. You can buy Clicos for different rivet sizes. The system I own is all for eighth inch rivets because that's what I use in both blind and normal hammered rivets. Nicely. There we 
we go. I am at a reasonable, a reasonable point here. I've got both gauntlets um, uh, test assembled. I'm going to need to go in and roll these edges, this edge and this edge, and then do the same on the other gauntlet. Um, but right now I'm taking care of the last of the busy, busy work, which is to make all the finger and thumb lames. Uh, and so I'm starting to attach my pieces, and they're gonna come in, a look. they're gonna come in like this. These are some like four ounce leather that I had. Fingertip goes there. Then I add a set of, I think three. And then I, once I have that, I, I make a hole at the top of each of these knuckles and attach those. I will attach those. Uh, not immediately. First, we're doing all the fingertips. We're gonna do all the fingertips and, oh, um, I'm gonna make one modification here. I'm using these nice soft aluminum rivets for the very fingertip, tippy tip um, rivet that you see, but all the rivets that you can't see, I'm just gonna use blind rivets, normal pop rivets, because you won't see them. That's what I'm looking for. That's a fingertip. Love it. And I think I'm going to do all of the things out of, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so here we go. Cut. You see how much I like assembly lining when I can?
Uh, okay, um, I am about to try some of the aluminum black on my aluminum. And this is, uh, this is corrosive acid. Um, you gotta be really, really careful. We're gonna clean everything with a degreaser. Uh, we're gonna uh, head it all with quad zero steel wool. I'm just looking to see what, um, uh, selenius acid and flu fluoboric acid. Um, I have a couple of other precautions going on. I have my overhead ceiling fan going and I've got air. So that fan right there, that's blowing air right across me. And I'm gonna be wearing this. I have no desire to die yet. Uh, so, uh, that is what I'm, uh, so what I'm about to do, yeah. Actually, I guess I don't need this yet. So the first thing is to um, use steel wool to take off the oxidation that's on the aluminum. And you're not gonna succeed in getting all the oxidation off the aluminum, that's fine. Plus, <clears throat> yeah, you're just removing a little bit of the aluminum oxide coating that naturally forms on aluminum. And we're gonna give all of these finger lames their quick treatment before we start attaching them. Because to do it afterwards would be a nightmare. We're gonna be ginger about these fingertips on the leather because we don't wanna necessarily mess up the leather, but yeah, we'll see. So now we do one, two, three, four, five, six, 79, 10, 11, 12, 24, 26, 28. Yeah, all of them, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, six, four, six, 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 wow, I'm five. I know I counted carefully. Thirty, thirty-one. Okay, so I have three extras. Excellent. Now we're gonna do the finger legs, and we're not gonna. This is right. Now, if my uh, if I if I wanted this finish to be a super high quality finish, I would do way more cleaning than this. I would probably uh, bring these all to the same sanding finish, um, and then I would, yeah. But uh, and this aluminum black is not like a full surface solution. It's very difficult, from what I can see and from my experience to get a nice uniform black coat with the aluminum black. But that's not what I'm looking for here. Here I'm looking for um, just this, uh, this like scarred charcoal coating, you know? Um, and the test results I got from the pieces I did yesterday, I'm very, I feel very uh, optimistic about. Okay, now we do a little cleaning. And this is done with some acetone. And it's just about taking off oil to oil and grease. Okay. It's best to wear gloves for the whole cleaning procedure because even your finger oils will lead to an uneven finish. And again, like I said, a totally even finish is not mission critical for me here. But it's important. I mean, you know, best practices and all that. I don't want any blank spots, so I do a fair job. I try not to do the inside because that has where all my labeling is. The other thing I like about acetone is that it evaporates really quickly. And again, acetone's not the best stuff to breathe, but I've got the fan blowing past me, so it's not that big of a concern. Okay, I'm gonna do the leather pieces first because they're kind of, uh, I don't wanna, I don't know, I'm just doing the leather pieces first. I'm putting the aluminum 
This is a chemically inert tray made for lab work. I'm putting the aluminum black in a little container in here. This means that I'm not gonna contaminate it by continuing to dip a swab into the main bottle, plus it also provides a uh, spill protection. I'm gonna be using these swabs and we'll see how we go. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is great. Beautiful. I'm gonna rinse these now. All right, I'm very happy with these. They look great. So I'm gonna to continue to cover the metal. I think uh, I noticed that the acid is getting a little bit uh, weaker, which is fine. I don't mind working with this stuff when it's a little bit less potent. I can feel it getting warm. It's not a fun feeling. Whew. But I'll get everything covered here. And I'll do a second pass, perhaps of some problem areas and we'll see how I go. Right now it is covering really nicely uh, for the most part. Uh, it tends to be the strongest where it first contacts the part. Which is why you wanna get good coverage right away, I believe. Once I have all of these parts covered, I'm going to take this whole tray over to the sink and do my rinsing there. But that's only after the second application of aluminum black. Oh yeah, I can totally feel the aluminum getting warm from the chemical reaction. It's a spooky feeling. I don't mind telling you. Yeah, see, it's very hard to get a super consistent coat with this. I may have to do a second cleaning pass. We'll see. Oh wow, that is really pretty actually. All right, uh, yeah, I'm gonna let this all sort of sit here and then I'm gonna take it all and rinse it. I'm mostly pleased with how uh, the blackening came out. I'm gonna rinse everything in cold water and uh, assess where we are. All right, uh, a couple things. This has done great at doing a kind of a robust undercoat that's nice and dark, that won't scratch away like a paint coat. I am also still gonna add something of a paint coat. Here's one of the tacits. Um, first of all, I need a, a kind of a semi-gloss finish on it, not a, not a totally matte finish. I'm gonna hit this with a little black, black primer and then it's just, there's gonna be a little back and forth on the painting technique and treatment of this to get it to match this old kind of semi-black and silver. It's a tough color, uh, but you know, I think the latitude I have from the universe is fairly wide. Um, and then I'm going to, oh, it's not even three yet, that's great. A uh, couple of hours, I should be able to wrap this up. Uh, for big parts, this can be problematic. You can see the streakiness um, I'm not that concerned about it because like I said, I'm gonna hit this with some black, but the aluminum black is an acid treatment meant for touch-ups for gunsmiths. So it's meant for small areas. It's not, it's super not ideal for large areas, but for this costume, it's just fine. I'm attaching in the chain mail. This is the Weta Workshop chain mail. Ooh, look at how pretty it is pictured on Aragorn's arms. Yes, so I'm about to put it in here and lay it in here using some zip ties. I am not above using modern technology. 
I'm gonna put every zip tie through two rings so we have uh, more than a single point of failure. This looks great. That looks really great. I'm very happy. All right, so that piece, oh, gotta flip those things out. Time to place the tassets, and they're pretty straightforward where they go. That's my elbow cup right there. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, um, let's take a look at it next to the other one. Yeah, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually a little smooth, all things considered, but we're gonna put it up and I'll do the final weathering pass. Let's, uh, yeah, let's get this going. <laughs> now it's looking like a suit of armor. Good looking suit of armor, if I say so myself. All right. So I've been avoiding it long enough. It's time to put these gauntlets together. Okay, 
One of the things Terry English told me about setting my armor up on an armor stand when I was about to take my Excalibur armor home was, make sure you don't make the feet too straight up and down. You gotta get some gesture in that thing. And obviously I make a lot of costumes, I keep them on mannequins, and mannequins can be a real pain in the butt getting a good gesture out of it. But for the uh, Mordred's Lieutenant armor that I have just finished in this video, I have achieved an excellent gesture of the character. And here's the reveal. There he is. Look at him. Oh, yes. Right? There is, this is slightly off kilter. I have him holding a rubber LARPing axe because the henchmen were all axe based. Dude, I, I am so, <laughs> I'm so happy about it. It looks great. It is a beautiful piece. And now it's complete. That's the thing. It was just sitting over there missing a few bunch of pieces. Now it's not. Now it's no longer lonely. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. All right. There may be some more armor soon. I may remake these gauntlets because technically he should have um, cup, cup mitten gauntlets. I'm sorry. I don't remember what they're called at this very moment. I think I should make a set of mitten gauntlets for him. I don't think they would have wasted fingers on the on the Mordred's henchmen. It's budgetary reasons, man. They wouldn't do it. Um, so there might be some more armor in the near future. But uh, until then, thank you guys for joining me for this one day build. It has been awesome. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Bye. I'm gonna just stare at this for a while. Thank you guys for watching that video. If you'd like to further support us at Tested, you can do so by buying some merch from us in our store. A link is below, but I wanted to tell you that for the first time, we are releasing a discounted bundle of Tested merch, specifically our original five demerit badges. These are ways in which every maker screws up. So we've got the measure once, curse twice, uh, releasing the mysterious blue smoke from electronics and stopping them from working breaking a drill bit, uh, 3D printer going all flying spaghetti monster on you, and my personal most common one, cutting your finger. <laughs> yeah. Get yourself over to tested-store.com and uh, line yourself up with some demerit badges. I'm going to sew these to my apron. Oh, that actually would make a good one-day build.